This is Chapter Six of A Tramp Abroad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Tramp Abroad by Mark Twain. Chapter Six: A Sport That Sometimes Kills. The third duel was brief and bloody. The surgeon stopped it when he saw that one of the men had received such bad wounds that he could not fight longer without endangering his life. The fourth duel was a tremendous encounter. But at the end of five or six minutes the surgeon interfered once more, another man so severely hurt as to render it unsafe to add to his harms. I watched this engagement as I watched the others, with rapt interest and strong excitement, and with a shrink and a shudder for every blow that laid open a cheek or a forehead, and a conscious paling of my face when I occasionally saw a wound of a yet more shocking nature inflicted. My eyes were upon the loser of this duel when he got his last and vanquishing wound. It was in his face, and it carried away his—but uh, no matter, I must not enter into details. I had but a glance, and then turned quickly, but I would not have been looking at all if I had known what was coming. No, that is probably not true. One thinks he would not look if he knew what was coming, but the interest and the excitement are so powerful that they would doubtless conquer all other feelings. And so, under the fierce exhilaration of the clashing steel, he would yield and look after all. Sometimes spectators of these duels faint, and it does seem a very reasonable thing to do, too. Both parties to this fourth duel were badly hurt so much that the surgeon was at work upon them nearly or quite an hour a fact which is suggestive. But this waiting interval was not wasted in idleness by the assembled students. It was past noon, therefore they ordered their landlord downstairs to send up hot beefsteaks, chickens, and such things, and these they ate, sitting comfortable at the several tables, whilst they chatted, disputed, and laughed. The door to the surgeon's room stood open meantime, but the cutting, sewing, splicing, and bandaging going on in there in plain view did not seem to disturb anyone's appetite. I went in and saw the surgeon labor a while, but could not enjoy. It was much less trying to see the wounds given and received than to see them mended. The stir and turmoil and the music of the steel were wanting here. One's nerves were wrung by this grisly spectacle, whilst the duel's compensating pleasurable thrill was lacking. Finally the doctor finished, and the men who were to fight the closing battle of the day came forth. A good many dinners were not completed yet, but no matter, they could be eaten cold after the battle. Therefore everybody crowded forth to see. This was not a love duel, but a satisfaction affair. These two students had quarreled, and were here to settle it. They did not belong to any of the corps but they were furnished with weapons and armor, and permitted to fight here by the five corps as a courtesy. Evidently these two young men were unfamiliar with the dueling ceremonies, though they were not unfamiliar with the sword. When they were placed in position they thought it was time to begin, and they did begin, too, and with a most impetuous energy, without waiting for anybody to give the word. This vastly amused the spectators, and even broke down their studied and courtly gravity, and surprised them into laughter. Of course, the seconds struck up the swords and started the duel over again. At the word, the deluge of blows began, but before long the surgeon once more interfered, for the only reason which ever permits him to interfere, and the day's war was over. It was now two in the afternoon, and I had been present since half-past nine in the morning. The field of battle was indeed a red one by this time, but some sawdust soon righted that. There had been one duel before I arrived. In it one of the men received many injuries, while the other one escaped without a scratch. I had seen the heads and faces of ten youths gashed in every direction by the keen two-edged blades, and yet had not seen a victim wince, nor heard a moan, or detected any fleeting expression which confessed the sharp pain the hurts were inflicting. This was good fortitude indeed. Such endurance is to be expected in savages and prize-fighters, for they are born and educated to it. But to find it in such perfection in these gently-bred and kindly-natured young fellows is matter for surprise. It was not merely under the excitement of the sword-play that this fortitude was shown. It was shown in the surgeon's room, where an uninspiring quiet reigned, and where there was no audience. The doctor's manipulations brought out neither grimaces nor groans. 
and in the fights it was observable that these lads hacked and slashed with the same tremendous spirit after they were covered with streaming wounds which they had shown in the beginning the world in general looks upon the college duels as very farcical affairs true but considering that the college duel is fought by boys that the swords are real swords and that the head and face are exposed it seems to me that it is a farce which had quite a grave side to it people laughed at it mainly because they think the student is so covered up with armor that he cannot be hurt but it is not so his eyes and ears are protected but the rest of his face and head are bare he can not only be badly wounded but his life is in danger and he would sometimes lose it but for the interference of the surgeon it is not intended that his life shall be endangered fatal accidents are possible however for instance the student's sword may break and the end of it fly up behind his antagonist's ear and cut an artery which could not be reached if the sword remained whole this has happened sometimes and death has resulted on the spot formerly the student's armpits were not protected and at that time the swords were pointed whereas they are blunt now so an artery in the armpit was sometimes cut and death followed then in the days of sharp pointed swords a spectator was an occasional victim the end of a broken sword flew five or ten feet and buried itself in his neck or his heart and death ensued instantly the student duels in germany occasion two or three deaths every year now but this arises only from the carelessness of the wounded men they eat or drink imprudently or commit excesses in the way of overexertion inflammation sets in and gets such a headway that it cannot be arrested indeed there is blood and pain and danger enough about the college duels to entitle it to a considerable degree of respect all the customs all the laws all the details pertaining to the student duel are quaint and naive the grave precise and courtly ceremony with which the thing is conducted invests it with a sort of antique charm this dignity and these knightly graces suggest the tournament not the prize-fight the laws are as curious as they are strict for instance the duelist may step forward from the line he is placed upon if he chooses but never back of it if he steps back of it or even leans back it is considered that he did it to avoid a blow or contrive an advantage so he is dismissed from his corps in disgrace it would seem natural to step from under a descending sword unconsciously and against one's will and intent yet this unconsciousness is not allowed again if under the sudden anguish of a wound the receiver of it makes a grimace he falls some degrees in the estimation of his fellows his corps are ashamed of him they call him harefoot which is the german equivalent for chicken-hearted end of chapter six